look at this, isn't it? Lovely to see everybody who's in, in the world of bike riding. We love it. Lots of familiar faces. Yeah. Yes. Many, yeah. many yeah. familiar faces. And the thing with Rouleur is you realise how many people love this sport and want to celebrate it in the way we do. Simon, coming to you first, I said there, a visionary pioneer. I know you like that one. <laughs> Call your mum up, tell her, put it on the Twitter bio. Um, how did your love affair with cycling start, though? Uh, well, it started a long time ago, but what's so perfect about being here is that in 2004, 18 and a bit years ago, we launched Rafa 50 metres that way. So as I walked in today, and I haven't been here for 10 years or 12 years or something to the Truman Brewery, as, we, as I walked in, I was going to go left to the little display area. We had one little gallery where we started Rafa. So going back in time and then going fast forward here where you've got so many people, some of whom were probably there at the Kings of Pain in 2004. Hands up anybody who was there in 2004. <laughs> there you are, good old <laughs> friends. There's a few of us left. Um, it's, uh, it brings it all full circle. But, but where it started was you know, a long time ago as a kid, probably like most people in the room, riding a bike and just falling in love with it. And it was a common trait through my sort of early adulthood and into my adult life. And when I got kids and, and a wife and a career, it seemed even more important that I rode my bike and it just gave me that release and that, that time away and time with my friends and a way of keeping fit and all the other things. So it's, it's a very natural story, much the same as everybody else. Nothing to do with the industry, nothing to do with making clothes, nothing to do with riding my bike professionally, as those of, us, those of you here who ride with me know that I'm not very fast. But I just <laughs> loved it, as most people here do. Yeah, and I'm sure that's something so many can relate to, that cycling is such a form of freedom and, and joy and escapism, as you said. Paul, for you, um, what might have been, eh? We could be speaking to you as a pro. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, just explain it. You were obviously riding a bike as a kid, yep. aged 11 in Nottingham, absolutely loving it. But the cycling world's loss was the fashion world's gain. Yeah. Your impact in both has been extraordinary, <laughs> but it, it could have all been different, couldn't it? Talk us through that journey um, from starting riding to... to a yeah, I, I, got, right I got bought uh, this funny bike <laughs> when I was 11. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, as you can see, corduroy shorts <laughs> and a sweater. <laughs> so it wasn't exactly uh, uh, cutting edge. Uh, it, it was 108 years ago, so, <laughs> so yeah, it was a long time ago. Now, I mean, this, the guy, uh, my, my dad bought me that bike, and he bought it from a guy who said, oh, there's a club, Beeston Road Club, just outside of Nottingham. If your lad wants to come on a bike ride with us, you know, get him to come along, and then... Uh, I did, and then got, got hooked on it. That's, this is uh, me in my racing, uh, from my racing license, uh, wearing a rayon, a rayon, not a wool jersey, because my first jersey was wool, and uh, this was very, very racy. Well, this was tech. This was yeah, this was high tech. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, got, I just got hooked on on bike riding. I left school at 15. Uh, I said to my dad that I wanted to be a, a bike rider, and he said, that's not a real job. So <laughs> I, got, I got sent in to work in a warehouse as the gopher. But the good thing was it, I had to ride my bike there and ride my bike back. And then uh, at, at 18, I, I had a crash that, and broke lots of bones uh, on my bike. And then, um, as you say, the, I uh, ended up being a clothes designer. I mean, actually, I never would have been a good bike rider, I just wasn't brave enough and not strong enough, but I loved it. I pretended I, I could have been, you know, good. Yeah, we'll stick with that line. Yeah, you yeah, could have yeah, been yeah, a pro. Yeah. You could have been a pro if it weren't for the yeah. broken femur. Uh, we'll stick with it. You were always inspired by and, and I guess harnessed by the cycling aesthetic, weren't you? Even look, in looking at those pictures we've just seen, yeah. you mentioned what you were wearing and how you looked. And I know I've seen in a few interviews you hated black socks, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, because Remember sort of the boys you rode with thinking they're wearing black socks. And now dreadful. it's considered uh, very different, yeah, of course. No, you're still right. Yeah. Still yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was one kid called uh, Richard Notley. I remember his name really well. 14. He always beat me and he had black socks and hairy <laughs> legs. I mean, how could he possibly That's do expensive. well? But it, it also, it, it was the, it, with Richard, it was an interesting... I got my own back without realising it because I suddenly realised I got something called a sense of humour because we were in Derbyshire one day with Richard and I said something to him and he laughed so much 
that he fell off his bike and went over a stone wall. So that was it. I got my, <laughs> so um, we got, I got my own bike on him. Yeah. On his black socks. But anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, so I had a crash, ended up in hospital and came out of hospital and discovered the local pub, which is where all the art students went and ended up in the world of creativity. So that was, um, it was different. But I've, I just kept in touch with... With, with cycling and bike riders, and I'm privileged to say that, um, obviously, I, Simon, but also a lot of the bike riders come and see me in my office. I've got, well, you've seen how many jerseys I've got. It's just like, <laughs> so wonderful, <laughs> yeah, lovely. Yeah, we'll come on to your collection. Anyone yeah. I speak to about this is breathless with delight uh, at the sheer enormity of it. Um, did you ever tell Richard you hated his black socks? Uh, well... Yes. yes. He was too, yeah, he was too good. I mean, he just kept winning. They just and went off into the I distance. didn't dare tell him, I don't think. Yeah. He was a fireman. Oh. That was very interesting about, you know, early bike riders. They were all seemed to be farmers or Yeah, they were working or, or people. working people. Yeah. Very strong guy. Amazing. Yeah, amazing guy. But that expression that if you're good enough, if you're strong enough, it doesn't matter what you wear. That's very common in most sports and it's definitely common in cycling. Hopefully nobody subscribes to that here. So obviously, <laughs> I think one of the things that we managed to do was to give people who weren't very good um, an opportunity to feel like they looked a bit better. Um, and so even if they weren't keeping up with the guy in front, they could yeah. feel that they looked better and they didn't wear black socks and you know they wore nice. You things. transformed the way you know people looked on bikes and turned it into something that was just very different. And now, of course, urban just urban cycling is so stylish as well and you can build your own bike and do your own colors and it's fantastic i mean there yeah. in my my beginning of my career there was no choice you, you know you just got a bike there was only one jumper you could wear anyway which was can you imagine three after 125 miles on a sunday age 14 in the rain with a wool jersey on <laughs> oh and God. wearing the same one the next day it got heavier and heavier and heavier <laughs> you know <it's> like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't wait to get in the bath, you know, with Radio Luxembourg on. Yeah, it's so <laughs> chill. We used to go to a bike, I mean, now, you know, we used to go, I lived in Nottingham, we used to cycle to Coventry or wherever, to the race, ride for 45 miles as a junior, and then hope you didn't crash because you had to ride back home that night. So it was very different, you know. Yeah. But it's not that long ago that it all changed. I mean, it's only 18 years ago or 17, 16 years ago that we started. And back then, I, mean, I don't know how many people here rode... Who, who, put your hand up if you rode actively 18 years ago. Oof. Wow. A lot. Well, we've got some old-timers, so yeah, we've, we've packed you in because we're old-timers too. Yeah. But, but it's less than half, probably. But most of you would have felt like social lepers 18 years ago. You know, you wouldn't have, you'd talk to people about what you did and they'd, it'd be a completely different language, a completely different world. Um, and when we opened here, it was like people were coming out. It was like lots of people who were closet cyclists. <laughs> go out yeah. at 6 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday and go and ride with their mates. And, but nobody knew because we were sort of, you know, we kept it quiet. They all came out of the woodwork and everyone came and it was like a celebration. And I think Ruler Alive is like a sort of that on steroids now. It's amazing yeah. over 18 years later to see so many people who can now come out openly. So well done for coming out, you guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well done, everyone. Uh, yeah. That brings me on to the next question, which was the inspiration behind Rafa. Because as you say, cycling didn't enjoy the following it now has back then, and you did something that was well ahead of the time. Uh, well, it was a gaping gap. I mean, there was a massive gap in the market. There, there wasn't a market for things that people coveted and really wanted to buy. Um, there wasn't much choice. The stuff that was out there was, was ugly, poor technical fabrics, badly made, no service, sold through terrible retail. It was all, sorry if anybody here worked in the industry back then, but <laughs> it wasn't very good. So someone like me who had no real experience but had passion for it, you could stand out and you could make a difference. But the passion came from my life of riding, riding a lot in the Europe and going to these amazing places 
um, learning about the history, and I, I spent a long time studying the history of cycling, which was really hard to do because there was no internet and there was about 10 books and virtually no magazines. They were all in French and we used to yeah. read L'Equipe and get as much as we could, but I poured over that and I discovered this. I wasn't the only person who loved this stuff. And there was such a rich seam of beautiful, amazing iconography and it's a whole life and lifestyle. And yet I'd go to my bike shop and it was kind of like, not like that at all. It was very functional. Um, so I just got more and more obsessed with it basically and decided that I had to tell those stories and get more people involved. And as I was riding more and more and enjoying it more and pushing myself harder and realizing that it was the most important thing that I did every day was to ride my bike and get that therapy and push myself harder and then feel that, which we've all felt, I'm sure, in the room, you feel that realization that, oh, actually, I can do more and I feel some calm that comes over me when I'm suffering. That was just the most magnetic thing for me. And again, it wasn't evident in the cycling world at all. So that's what I tried to package up. It's a form of meditation, isn't it, almost, cycling? Totally. When you hit that sweet spot on the road and your legs are going and you feel great and hopefully you've got a tailwind and the sun's shining. You said the word obsessed then. I'm going to pick up on that because I think for both of you, as I said at the start, cycling is in your DNA. And Ed Pickering, editor of Rouleau, who's just over there, said to me um, in preparation for this interview that the feeling is clothes are what you both do, but cycling is a feeling you have inside of you. Would you both agree with that? And, and if so, what is it? Can you pinpoint that one thing about cycling, about this simple sport that we all love that has really trapped you, encaptured you? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's, it's taking on what I was just saying. It's, it's about application and effort and proportionality. So the more you put in, the more you get out. There's no shortcuts. There's no, you can't just put on cool kit and be good. You have to apply yourself um, and that's, an, obs that's a, an addictive process. And you can do it in half an hour, you can do it in a day, you can do it in a week, but I need to have that every day. That's for me, the, that's where the passion comes from. Sense of freedom. Yeah. Sense of freedom, the open road, and it's down to you, you know, you, whether it takes two hours to get somewhere or you know, 45 minutes, you know, depending on how you're feeling. <laughs> uh, and just the sense of freedom, and especially in the, the pressure, pressured world we all live in right now. I mean, just getting out of your bike, it's such a, such a joy. Look at that. <laughs> That's a beauty, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was Indoran's jersey. The days we wear team <laughs> kit. <laughs> Miguel Ind Indoran. You remember? Yes, I do that indeed. Yeah. 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 That was the first carbon fiber mountain bike. That was at my house in Italy. Wow. So, uh, yeah. But there's also camaraderie, I think, is, is an increasingly an appeal, and I'm sure lots of people here will meet every year and meet at Ruler Alive and have a coffee or a beer or whatever. And riding a bike gives you this gateway to this incredible community. And it's the thing I'm probably most proud of at Rafa is that we've built a real community. It's not an internet-based Strava kind of tick box. It's people who ride together, and there are lots of club members I can see here. We've got, this year, there'll be 10,000 Rafa cycling club, club rides. So that's not people who've logged on Strava, that's people who meet up and go for a physical bike ride out. Wonderful. 10,000 yeah. in a year. And that, yeah, that's an amazing yeah. commu proper community of people who are probably firm friends and they've shared their war stories and their, their suffering, but they've also got huge amounts out of it. Yeah, you share those real moments out on the road with, with people you ride with, don't you? Paul, you were talking about Indurand's jersey there. Let's go to your collection, because it is vast, isn't it? Um, I think you said, I'm not, um, I'm not a collector, I just have a lot of the same thing. That's right, I yeah. I that <laughs> didn't quite realise that was called a collector. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. might be the same yeah. thing. Um, yeah. But, I mean, as I said, everyone I've spoken to about this has just been enraptured by it. It's just the most extraordinary thing to see. Um, one of the finest collections of bikes, clothing, memorabilia, and magazines as well. I yeah. mean, where does, this, where does the inspiration to collect, if we can say that, come from? And, and how proud are you of, of this collection and the history that comes with it? Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, guys from Ruler was just up in my archive yeah. in, in Nottingham. And they said, I, they said, oh, can we go and look at it? because there's an exhibition of some of my stuff here. I said, oh, I think there's about 20 boxes. And he said there was over 120 boxes, <laughs> which I didn't quite realize that. I just love stuff, you know. 
Yeah. You're sending stuff as well, though, aren't you? Yeah. All the time. I guess, uh, yeah. I mean, l last week I got Tom Pid up, Pidcock's jersey, and, uh, Woot's jersey. Uh, that, you know, they, it just comes all the time. It's wonderful. And, uh, yeah, there's a big mountain of it. I think Georgie, when I first Georgina met... over here got the job of trying to find a jersey yesterday. She didn't have any luck. <laughs> <laughs> Eight <when> hours <laughs> later, she was still <laughs> looking for the jersey. Yeah? When I first met you, though, I don't think you had much of a collection in that office. No. But 20 years later, it's now halfway up the windows. Yeah. So I reckon in about three or four years, you won't be able to see out the window. No, no. <laughs> That's true. I, I just think that I, I'm, I'm not just a collector of cycling. Uh, memorabilia or, or bike riding stuff. I mean, I've got, as you can see, lots of books and art. And I just th I think that if somebody designs something, that I, I'm quite interested in why they've designed it. What, what's, what are the key points? What's the, the point about it? And of course, I've, I was asked to design the Giro jersey a few years ago, which was nice, and Tour of Dubai jersey. And of course, I worked with Simon the Locker. We did, the first jersey we did uh, was uh, 2007. So I should point out that this belongs to Jasper, who's at the back there. Yes. <laughs> so Thank you, Jasper. You are going to get it back. Yeah, yeah. Thank we'll you make sure you get it back, mate. Um, so this, this was our 2007 Grand wow. Depart jersey, which Paul designed with our team, and it's used sport wall, and it's full of embellishments. And it was 175 quid at the time. So 2007, that was quite a shocking price for a cycling jersey. I looked the other day, there's now about 10 brands who are charging significantly more than that for a cycling jersey. So, so key, where's, we're ahead of the make time. Make sure we get it back to yeah, you. Yeah, it's now on eBay <laughs> for quite a lot. Not this <laughs> one, but you can buy them on eBay for quite a lot of money. The but interesting thing about Rafa and Simon, though, is they were a real pain in the backside right. to work for. <laughs> Thank you. No, they in were what way? Only because... No, not at all. Uh, but they were just so uh, pure and mm -hmm. so so much about the detail and you know i'd be really excited to show them but, yeah, but that stitch is it 22 stitches to the inch or 18 stitches to the inch well we were trying to we were trying to do stuff <laughs> yeah. that you could wear on the bike as well yeah. as it just being fashion yeah. so things like lock stitches and yeah. density and that kind of stuff really and embroidery it. and uh, you know all sorts of things on detail on there that was very difficult to do I've got all sorts of nonsense these, in some here. Some of the other things that we This did. is like your, like your office here. Yeah. Because you what? have some of the new collection here with you, don't you, Simon, as well? Yeah, we've got a new collection coming out in the spring. Mm -hmm. we've yeah. done, I think we've probably done seven or eight different collections over the years. Yes. This was an early one with reflective wow. polka dots, which yeah. some of them used so. to sort of drift off in the wind when uh, they weren't very well <laughs> applied, but that That's was great fun. That was a sort of Malia Nero, which we got into trouble from the Giro organizers for, so thanks for that. More practical here. one. Yeah, this is like, we did quite a lot of um, lifestyle sort of city yes. wear, yeah. which went on to influence quite a lot of stuff out in the market. This is a windproof shirt, which uses... Oh, that's cool. That was a pattern that you developed yeah. using your own writing. Yeah. Um, it's got a big reflective dot on the back, which is what we've done all the time. It's got little stories in There's it. There's always a lot of detail on the practical. Yeah. Uh, you know, windproof, waterproof, breathable. When I did the work for Tour of Dubai, you know, it had to be a UV filter on the back and breathable on the front because of the temperature. Yeah. And so there's a lot of sort of stuff that you have to, you can't just do, oh, that looks pretty. You know, and I think like that's what we're all, people in this room probably all want. You want stuff that works better than anything out there, yeah. but you also want stuff that looks quite good as well. Uh, our, you feel our, proud to wear. Both the, the Paul Smith product and the Rafa Paul Smith product. We've always just worked hard on detail. This is from the new... So this is a new one for spring next year. So it's got wow. a rabbit motif, which is one of Paul's yeah. common motifs. You're given a rabbit before every fashion, fashion show, Fashion show, yeah. Rabbits are just good luck for me. So we've got a little... I love it. Yeah. This was really much, very much based on... Because there's been such a trend on, uh, on pro, pro wear... Uh, based on sponsors and sponsorships as well. And, uh, and this, you know, in the sort of 90s, there was such an explosion of more sponsors written yes. on the jersey and more colour. And so this was loosely based on, on just a trend for more, more colour and more things written on. And but uh, we've done shoes and... and yeah, so the, in spring we've got some pro team shoes with the rabbit logo on the motif on the bottom. We've got 
sunglasses with Paul Smith stripes on them. Stripes, this is yeah. this is a knitted Men's and women's. knitted uh, so woven it's, woven. Uh, so it's very high high tech woven. Sorry, but yeah, as opposed to leather or uh, suede. Yeah. But it's quite interesting exploring extreme color because in many ways when I started Rafa it was a reaction against that extreme color mm. Pulte jerseys and these crazy sort of horrible explosions in paint factories we used to call them so we wanted to do stuff that was much more pared down more wearable the sort of thing you'd want to wear yeah. mm -hmm. when you got off the bike as well as on the bike and interestingly now how fashions change we now do quite a few a couple of our designers are in the room. We do quite a few of our own explosions in paint factories, yeah. and the fashion's gone onto that. I suspect it will come back full circle, but now there's there's so much tasteful product out there mm. that it's it's harder. You have to work harder to stand out, and you have to work harder to to create better product because it's all come up to a really good level. As have the prices, which I'm sure you've noticed. Yeah, we're no longer the most expensive brand by at all, um, mm. which is pretty amazing. And how did the relationship between the two of you come about before that first collaboration? Well, I, I tracked him down. I stalked Paul for many years. <laughs> and if I, I reminded him last week that 20 years ago, I went to meet him. I finally got a meeting with Paul. And I used to buy lots of Paul's clothing. <laughs> and I went to see him. And I got my business plan. And I got my de crude designs for products. And I, I thought, this could be it. It's going to be Rafa for Paul Smith. This is going to be fantastic. I won't have to worry. I'll be able to pay myself a salary. It'd be great. <laughs> and he was charming. And he, he, he was very complimentary about the work, but said, yeah, but I've got 500 projects. I run my own business. I'm oh, a no, bit obsessed with basically cycling. I said no. I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. So I walked out with my oh, portfolio no. of stuff, and I sat on a little cafe in Kingsway. And I was like, oh, shit. Of course, I was wrong. Again. I should have. I should have. <laughs> but we've done lots of projects together. But you how said did, how did you win him round? How, how did you say yes? Uh, I, think I, just, I think we kept in touch. He was very generous. He said, well, I'll, I'll help you however I can, but I can't invest in okay. this thing. So it can't be a distraction. So every six months or so, we'd have a cup of coffee. So we've, all, we've always done work from the beginning for Rafa, but not, not to do with financial things, just to, because we're mates, really. Yeah. And, uh, and both share the passion of doing things that are really good quality and, uh, and are correct, you know. And it'll right. hopefully continue for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, for sure we will, yeah. No, it's brilliant to see the new collection right here as well. Um, will the new collection be out at your stand too? Because you're going to your stand after this to, for some signing, aren't you? The, uh, yeah, yeah, and afterwards I'm going, yeah, I've got a little shop here somewhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going over there if anybody wants anything signed. I'm going there next, I think. Brilliant. Um, but this one is for March next year. Great. But there is our latest collection over there, yeah. Yeah, great stuff. You, you were talking there about making sure that the products you both create together are aligned. How do you ensure that they are aligned with your, your values and your passions and your outlook and, and kind of combine that passion for cycling with a professional outlook as well? I think that, uh, that was really what Simon was, uh, was uh, clear on right at that very first meeting is that, both that we both had the sort of similar values really. Just making nice, nice product that was good quality, relevant. You know, I've been working for many, many seasons now and I sell in 65 countries around the world and I've got many, many collections. And um, so y you've only survived that long because you do things nicely and properly and behave properly, well-mannered, well-organized. And that's what we've always respected of each other, really. There's quite a strong DNA that's shared as well. I mean, you're wearing lots of pink there. I am. Or today. It, accidentally, yeah. actually. I just yeah. love, I do love pink, but I love, I love Rafa for that reason, that yes. the, the pink is... Yeah, yeah and, we, and we adopted pink as our sort of accent color, mm. largely because of Paul, actually, because I used to buy lots of Paul's products, and he used to use a little pink logo yeah. on a dark gray background quite often. I always thought that was a really nice combination. So the reason we still use pink is partly that, partly the, the Giro and... Um, so it yeah. feels very natural, and I think when it stops feeling natural, then you don't want to carry on. You don't want to force things. Yeah, the Giro, obviously, the, you know, the GC of the Giro is pink, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's amazing that, that that's the colour that they chose, really, for, for a, bike, a bike race all those years ago. Yes. Amazing. It's a good colour, though, pink. 
It's my favourite, yeah, obviously. You've got yeah. all the yeah. <laughs> um, And your relationship with cycling, obviously cycling has evolved and changed over years and, and decades. How has your relationship with it changed and altered and, and shifted in that time? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, well, cycling, my relationship stayed the same, but, the, but cycling's changed so mm -hmm. much because, as I described earlier, it was very much a working man's sport at the beginning. It was very hard to find a club or a, 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 a race that you, you know, you could, the season was very spread out and hardly any races. And, um, Just like today. Almost, almost no professional teams at all at the moment. Mostly a few bike companies had, uh, had uh, teams, but... Uh, so it was very, and, and arriving, you know, arriving with your wheels, your, your racing wheels on your, on, on little clips at the side. <laughs> so it was very different. Um, and now it's very much about money and sponsorship and fame and um, media. And then it was just about having a go, really. Yeah, getting out Having a go and racing to the Nottingham sign and see who could get to the Nottingham <laughs> sign the quickest. And... Um, <laughs> yeah, whether you could... Uh, it's a bit different now, isn't it? But, I th but I th even though Ruler Alive is an amazing sign of how far things have come in the 15 to 20 years I've been involved, it's easy to... S and, it, and all the, the quality of product is much better and we don't have to compromise anymore and that's wonderful. There's lots of choice. Actually, it's still a super niche sport and it's ignored and irrelevant to most people. Um, and it's not as good as it should be. And you know, racing is one side of it, where it's you know, UK racing is pretty much bankrupt and it's a disaster. Global pro racing is all over the place and desperately needs to pull itself out of its own ass, if you pardon my expression. The lack of reporting um, in newspapers. As and I, I said mean, earlier. now, yeah, now you can see, yeah, you don't still don't see it in broadsheets. You can get loads of GCN coverage, but when the Tour de France is on, you might see it in one broadsheet or one online major media outlet, but. We are nowhere, so I think there's so, so much further to go. So it's, it's very easy to sit and rest on our laurels and go, oh yeah, Rafa's a nice big business and we've got lots of friends and customers and lots of products. But actually, cycling's too good for that. It needs to reach way more people. Um, so, that's, so for me, it hasn't changed at all. I still feel like we've just got to the first stage and, or the second stage and there's lots more to do. So that, you know, for a start, there should be 50% of people here should be women. There should be many more different ethnicities in the room. And I, I just think we are on a journey that's only just started. But I'm having a go to promote it. Well, I was <laughs> going to say, what do you think can be done, needs to be done? What one thing, perhaps, or maybe a multitude of things will help cycling break out of its bubble? Because I agree to an extent that it's the most extraordinary sport and it's, and it's the most extraordinary activity. And, you know, we, the love we have for cycling, we, we've expressed and, and the freedom and the joy and yeah. the application of it, the addiction of it. And you want to tell people Get on your bikes, try it, watch the Tour de France, watch this race. You know, you want to tell people to get involved. And it's how do, how do you think we can, we can I permeate that? I'd, I'd say there's three things. Number one is make Chris Boardman prime minister. I think yeah. that would probably help. Yeah. Um, but but more, <laughs> more seriously, I think they have to... The shop window is still important. Mm -hmm. And I think the shop window is broken. And changing the calendar is the number one thing. Simplifying communicating, mm. making it men and women combined, simplifying racing and making it easier to package and to, to sell would really help. And the third thing I think is, is finding heroes. The whole thing works with heroes. You know, Lance Armstrong, hero or villain, managed to take the sport from nowhere to really quite, yeah. quite common cultural territory in the US and globally. That's one person and we've got, you know, we've had Bradley and we've got Cav and we've got various heroes but they're, they're not enough and they're not, not strong enough in the media. So I think we need more heroes to cheer for. Get you back on the bike, I think. <laughs> <laughs> heroes who are better than me, that's for sure. Yeah. Paul, anything you could pinpoint that... No, I agree. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just, it's just, um, just talk it up, you know, yeah. because it's, it's not hype, it's true. It's just a beautiful thing to do. Riding a bike, fantastic. The sound of the tires. Yeah. When you free wheel and that, the sound. Yeah, the free wheel heart, the tick, 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 tick. Yeah, great. Yeah. And they're working out the style on your, on your bike and the, 
it's just so much good stuff. I mean, really, really fantastic. I used to keep my bike in the bedroom every night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, was people I was only 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Might we ever see a, a Paul Smith cycling team? Uh, if I had the cash, yes, yeah, so that would be good. <laughs> Apparently they're going quite cheap, Paul. 250 grand, you can do a pro, a Conti team in the UK. Wow. Come on, Paul. Well, I've got Amex. There's probably, <laughs> there might be 250 people here. Yeah. So if we each put a grand in, yeah. or Paul did half, and yeah. you each yeah. did 500 yeah. quid, what do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah. We could have our own team. The Paul Smith Ruler cycling team. Yeah, sounds good to me. There we go. You yeah. heard it here first. That's an exclusive for you all. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, of course, Simon, as well, as lot alongside founding Rafa, you were also a huge integral part of fi uh, founding Ruler, the magazine, as well, alongside Guy Andrews back in 2006. And for you, I guess, seeing that magazine now grow like it has and seeing the celebration of what the magazine is about and also what cycling is about here at Ruler Live must be lovely to see as you take a trip down memory lane back here into, into Brick Lane and, and Truman's Brewery. It really is. I mean, it's 2006 and I suppose most people here would know that we started Ruler, but I think lots of people in the market wouldn't know that anymore because it's, it's an old story and we sold our stake, I don't know, seven plus years ago. Um, but it was, the, the, as I said before, the the world was wide open for stuff that was better quality, that was more refined, that had more passion, more integrity. And that was true of the media as much as it was of, of great product. Great photography. And amazing photography, absolutely. Great writing, great photography. Yeah. And we just filled our boots. And, you know, Guy was working in, in journalism and was frustrated by how terrible the mags were. Sorry if some people here work in some of those mags. They used to be terrible. Um, and we wanted to get more involved in telling the stories, and cycling culture was very much how we saw our offer. So it just made sense for us to start Rouleur, but we sort of bootstrapped it, and I think we chose the price because it, it was the cost of um, the congestion charge per day. That's how we, that was how sophisticated our pricing was. So if you're worried about the pricing and want to speak to people at Rouleur, we started it by it being congestion charge, yeah. and it still is, I think. Yeah. So. Um, so we just had a lot of fun and did it really well, as well as we could. And it's incredible how much it's grown. And I think magazines have come and gone. You know, the magazine industry has been, been challenged, but media properties have come and gone as well. But Rula seems to be getting the formula right and is going from strength to strength. So, yeah, it makes me hugely proud of the fact that it's here and we're in the Truman Brewery and that's where we launched Rafa. It's, uh, it's a really nice coming together. Yeah, it's super special. And it's such high quality as well, really. I picked up a magazine earlier and just flicked the pages, and it just smells delicious. It's Smell of print. Really oh, important. Yeah. Like you could bottle that. I love it. And has done all female issues as well. Recently. Yes. yes. Yeah. That was hugely, hugely successful as well, wasn't very it? Very important. Yeah. Very Absolutely. Good. Really good. Um, so, Paul, you have got your stand here as well, haven't you? I have, yes. And you'll be signing bits there. Um, what's your, what's your favourite piece within your collection as a whole? And also, how is it organised? I was going to ask you this. Is it organised in any manner or way? <laughs> or is it... <laughs> no. <laughs> Floor to ceiling boxes and... <laughs> There's some lovely, I mean, Bernardino signed yeah, yellow jersey. Wow. Um, obviously, Bradley, Cav. David, Miller, Woot, Poot, Goot, all the <laughs> Belgiums. <laughs> now, it's lots of beautiful stuff. Uh, and uh, a lot of the Nibali and, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Gosh, every, yeah, all of them. Cav, Cav winning the first stage uh, in Na Naples uh, the year I designed the jersey. I won, I won it for you, but I'm really knackered now, <laughs> he said to me. Yeah. Was that your Manx accent there? <laughs> was that your Manx accent there? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got a Cav impression when they come up on stage. <laughs> Pete Kenyuk last year sort of massacred it. Um, but no, no the, and the new collection as well. Talk me through what inspired it, just finally as we wrap things up. For the, both the, of you, what was, what was the main goal? The main thing is, is really... Uh, the return to using more colour on, on yeah. the jerseys because if you look at a lot of the, the jerseys from that 90s period where they'd suddenly gone to having more promotional sponsorship on the jerseys and there, were, there was all those Zeds, wasn't there? The Zeds. Cartoon Capels. Mercato, uh, uh, you know, a lot of... Because previously they just had San Rafael or just one, one name written on. 
Um, but so it was very much about just adding, adding more, more, more color really to the That's jersey, beautiful. and uh, and little little details. I'm very practical. Uh, you know, still got all the all the stuff you need, and uh, that's it. I think fa fashions come and go, but great design can make sense of bold colours or monochrome or pattern or explosions in paint factories. You can do it well, or you can do it really badly. Mm. And some people still do it badly in cycling, but most people are starting to do it well, which is a huge relief because. We see these, we ride with people all the time, and it's much better than they look. I think one of the good things, if, without being too sore headed, is because we make our own clothes, have done for many, many years, then you, and, I, and I'm a bike rider. So you bring those two together, and then you're getting a product that's hopefully got all the, all the ingredients from a design and fun point of view, but also works, you know, which is what, why we work together for so long. Yep. It certainly works. Good. It really does. So Sir Paul Smith will be signing bits and bobs at your stand. Yeah, there's a they're really good book called the Scrap Scrapbook, um, which is yes, with part Richard of Williams. My, part of my memorabilia hoard. <laughs> 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 the book, the book uh, that's out there somewhere. You should just have a look at it, even if you don't get don't get it. But that was just two boxes out of the hundred boxes. <laughs> <laughs> So more to come. <laughs> yeah, about 50 more books to come. <laughs> Watch this space then. Yeah. 50 more books to come. Yeah. Uh, but yes, yeah, Sir Paul Smith will be signing bits and bobs, so do head out over there and, and go and meet Sir Paul and, and get whatever you'd like signed and take a look at just a slither of the extraordinary collection you have amassed. Um, but to both of you, thank you so much for Welcome. speaking about your love of cycling and, and what it means to well, you. Well done you. And what it means to all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. What it means to all of us as well.